I'm up first. Okay. Hi, everyone. So we are excited to have Andrew Gibbons on for today's episode of Collective Intellectuality. Andrew is professor at the School of Education at Auckland University of Technology. His work creatively and distinctively focused on philosophy of education, early childhood education, and science fiction. Andrew is involved in several professional organizations, including Association of Visual Pedagogies and Philosophy of Education Society of Australasia, and was recently named a PISA Fellow. Welcome, Andrew. Hi there. Um, so, Andrew, we'd like to just start with um, a, re a really general question in terms of how you would describe your work. Uh, how do you describe what you do? Well, um, I've been thinking a little bit about this, thinking about um, meeting with you guys and talking about my work. And um, I, every time I think about a description of my work, it changes. So what I'm about to say now, I probably won't have thought about um, in any, any other time. It, so, it's, so it's organic, it's always evolving, and, and it shifts in relation to the things I read and the experiences I have in, in my teaching. I mean, also obviously experiences that we have outside of our teaching too. Um, but at the moment, I would regard it as um, intentionally uh, playful and informed by popular culture um, that, that takes seriously scholarship within philosophy of education, but, but also recognize that that scholarship is also an engagement with the wider world. So, so I don't feel the, the necessity to kind of be in any way, whatever you might think of as a, as a pure philosopher of education. So I enjoy, I enjoy being motivated and and driven and guided by, you know, little moments, little engagements, uh, lots of children's TV. Um, was talking today about the importance of Mary Poppins to the philosophy of education. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are some examples. Um, and probably I go for breadth rather than depth in relation to engaging with the philosophy of education as a as a field, um, try and get a little bit of everything rather than throwing myself too deeply and and becoming a, a kind of a um, a Foucauldian or or whatever you, you might want to be. And most people don't admit to being Foucauldians, and Foucault wouldn't have. Uh, but also, you do see some people really making a career out of engagement with one or a group of philosophers. Whereas I, I'm kind of keen to to soak it all up. Um, and and see what I can do with it. A lot of what you do is in early childhood education, and why um, you know what attracted you to thinking about early childhood education and philosophy, and and why why is early childhood education an important side of philosophical reflection? I love working within the philosophy of ed and early childhood because uh, there's just so many ongoing debates and questions in relation to, for instance, the connection between care and education. Um, there's, you know, there are lots of challenges in the early childhood sector in relation to, you know, competing forces around economics, politics, um, and the uh, tension between practice and theory as well, you know, all of which I think really, um, you know, they really push me to see and develop good philosophical questions. Um, I, I want to say also that when I started out as an early childhood teacher um, and then moved into further study, and I never thought I was going to end up in philosophy. I actually was, I saw myself as a policy analyst initially when I started my master's. I had, I had this desire to in particular look at uh, inclusive education policy um, as a result of some of my experiences working in social work. So I really wanted to um, do education policy analysis, um, but I ended up having to take a philosophy of education paper um, because there was no other paper I could take at the time allowing for my schedule. Um, so I walked into this course having studied no philosophy whatsoever and meeting Jim Marshall and Michael Peters and, and Peter Roberts and just just my life changed. Like, uh, so, you know, meeting people who could, in, you know, inspire you, offer, offer you ideas, um, hand over the reins as well, you know, not they, they were the kinds of um, mentors and philosophers who um, were just kind of really open to you 
getting on board and, and taking philosophy in your own way. Um, so, so that's kind of how it happened. Um, but I also recognized that philosophy of education and early childhood education, uh, like a, within teacher education in particular, but also within my field as a teacher, there wasn't a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of early childhood academics working in that field. I mean, there, there, there were, uh, and perhaps asking questions, but not through traditional philosophy of ed uh, modes of inquiry. Um, so when I'd go to a conference and my colleague, Sandy Farquhar and I would often have this discussion about where we saw ourselves. Were we in the philosophy of, did we go to the philosophy of ed significant interest group or did we go to the ECE one and felt we were in, in a kind of no space, but that's changed a lot over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, colleagues like Marek Tessa, you know, really led the way at creating um, these awesome connections between philosophy of education and early child education so that you don't see these boundaries anymore. I think, you know, that's great. Um, I'm always motivated by, by what philosophy can bring to early childhood education, both um, within the institution, within teacher education, but also in childhood studies and policy studies and and I'm glad I didn't end up in policy studies, I have to say. Not, not that philosophy of education isn't contributing heavily to policy analysis, I think. You know, I haven't given up on policy, but um, yeah, I, I enjoy reading uh, philosophy of ed texts more than I enjoy reading policy analysis texts. Yeah, um, and speaking oh, to that, I mean, well, because it's interesting how you said there's kind of like you felt like there was this in between space between, you know, do you go to philosophy of education interest or do you go ECE? So coming from a, you know, early childhood education perspective, I think it might be interesting to hear, even though you do, you say breadth rather than depth, but what philosophers and theorists then have been influential, would you say, in the development of your work and then adding on where is that going now with philosophy and theorists? Yeah, yeah. Um, so probably, I mean, this is a, again, I mean, I'll, I'll think of some and I'll forget some um, to, in terms of readings and, and authors and, and influences, but I would definitely, you know, I just want to acknowledge the, the lecturers I had as a, early childhood teacher educator in the first year of a new diploma at the Auckland College of Education as an early childhood student teacher, sorry, um, that my lecturers, you know, really encouraged questioning. I was a terrible student in relation to producing my assignments on time or in any kind of tidy way, but um, I think that they, I feel that they appreciated that I was particularly interested in the conversations and the questions and, and it, it was a it was a fairly new sector in tertiary education and its in its configuration of a three year degree. Um, so you know they they encouraged me um, to ask questions and in particular also to engage with the with key scholars in terms of Kapapa Māori theory. Um, I, I remember being heavily influenced by Le Leonie Pihama. Um, and the work of Graham and Linda Smith. Um, but at that stage, I also didn't see myself as a student. I mean, I just wanted to go work in, in early childhood. And like I say, I was a pretty bad student. Um, it's ironic that I've ended up in teacher education. Uh, when, when I finished my diploma, I was like, I'm out of here. Hold on, sorry, there's an interruption. You can try and turn off your Microsoft Teams, but it always wants to turn itself back on. We'll get to the philosophy of technology a little bit later. Um, I'm going to track back a bit, like, and this is where the science fiction comes in. Um, my English teachers, when I was in secondary school and in high school, uh, they introduced me to Orwell and Huxley, and that radically changed my thinking. And then, um, you know, so I could suddenly saw school in, in a quite different way. So I, I've always understood the value of of science fiction for inviting you to see um, you know, in cliched terms the matrix um, and then moving on from that realizing I wasn't really connected to 
edu the education system in school and looking for learning outside of it I, I looked in popular culture for um you know for bands and movies and and books and um you know and and and, and people to change the way I was thinking w when I got into philosophy of education you know as I was saying by accident then I was introduced probably firstly to Foucault um and I found it really difficult to read Foucault I have to say um but the distillation of Foucault through um Michael and Jim and others really made sense to me um and and I find myself pointing graduate students to Foucault quite regularly in terms of their engagement with power and knowledge, their engagement with discourse. And probably most importantly, the idea of like the production of ones of the subject. So I'm always interested in encouraging student teachers, sorry, well, student teachers and, and graduate students to look at, you know, what kind of what kind of child subject is being produced within different configurations? So Foucault was probably the first. Um, then Leotard and Derrida um, jumped in there. I'd have to say. Then when I started my PhD, my super uh, my primary supervisor Jim had suggested I do a, a whole thesis on revisiting Rousseau. Which, which I didn't want to do. I, I actually wanted to study the, um, the debates around the use of technology in early child education um, and, and got that approved as a proposal. I'm now wondering why I, I didn't take Jim's advice, but anyway. Um, for three of the four years of my PhD, I refused to read Heidegger. Um, I, I said oh, I'm not I'm not going to do that to um, my supervisors and you know they were they were fine with that and then eventually I thought oh maybe I should read a little bit of the question concerning technology and I had to almost entirely rewrite my thesis but it, but it was a really important a really important text to read so question concerning technology um, and building dwelling thinking I think were, were were powerful pieces I mean I've read question concerning technology another three or four times and you know Foucault's had a hard to read well Heidegger's yeah and I you can I think maybe uh someone could potentially see the influence of reading Heidegger in my own writing like uh possibly I don't know is that something you can say about yourself but no one's ever said that in a peer review of course you sound like you've read too much Heidegger <laughs> um and the person I haven't mentioned yet, um, but that certainly influences my thinking and my work is um, Camus. So uh, it was it was working with Peter Roberts on the possibility of using Camus work in the philosophy of education that really, you know, excited me into getting getting away from being overly reliant on on, on analytic or continental traditions and philosophy of ed and allowing myself to immerse myself in, in the less traditional, uh, more popular and more fi more fictionally focused philosophers. So, you know, I've loved applying the story of Merceau to education. Um, I've loved looking at uh, La Peste, the plague. I mean, obviously that's been quite convenient for, for anyone writing and during the pandemic. Uh, so yeah. And then you know, every children's story I read, I, I can see awesome philosophy of education and wh whether it's a good story or not. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, I mean, I find it interesting um, what you what you had said earlier about being in between not knowing if you're in the philosophy of uh, education or early childhood education, because so much of in uh, and not, I'm not myself very, too familiar with early childhood education, but it seems like, you know, going back to Rousseau or something and thinking about Dewey, what the stuff I've read with Dewey and then with people like J.S. Neal. And it seems like there's a long kind of tradition of, of philosophy of, of, of early childhood or at least the, the child. And then it seems like you were saying, well, that kind of, that kind of, the, there just wasn't as much, um, activity or interest in early childhood education within philosophy. So 
I guess I guess this question is kind of how are you know philosophers like yourself um, and others perhaps now to rethinking some of the um, uh, rethinking some of the questions that have been longstanding in early childhood education. Um, and we were curious, especially about um, questions concerning like play, um, because that's a, that's a kind of longstanding um, uh, site of, of, of thinking about early childhood education. So yeah, how, how would you, how would, how, how would you respond to some of those um, comments, questions? I remember, um, you know, I remember thinking about like Rousseau's work and, and it's like quite tacit influence um, in relation to the construction of the early childhood curriculum in, in this country uh, and, and elsewhere perhaps, but definitely like um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ideas about childhood that, that resonate with for instance, this idea of the importance of the child playing in nature, and it's not just Rousseau, it's obviously also Froebel, and Froebel's probably had a more explicit influence over uh, some trends and traditions and, and dogma in this country in relation to early child education. Um, the, the, perhaps the best way to explain it uh, as a challenge in, in this country is that often philosophy is talked about as a having of a position rather than the asking of a question. So philosophy is something that you have to write as a statement of values and beliefs. And I'm not saying that's not philosophy, but to me, mm -hmm. it's not philosophical work. Um, mm -hmm. So you read Rousseau in teacher education, in early childhood teacher education, and are asked to then say what you believe rather than to read Rousseau and think about what Rousseau was exploring at the time in relation to social contracts, in relation to a concern for the industrial impact um, on, on, on childhood. Um, so it's like, you know, Rousseau set in some kind of weird stone um, that then means that people reading Rousseau now go, oh, I wouldn't want to read Rousseau because that doesn't really make any sense. Rather than understanding that what Rousseau was doing, you know, certainly was full of like um, quite a hard line beliefs about nature, about the world, about childhood, but also started with, you know, where are we going with the industrial revolution? Where are we going with the, the development of the, of the citizen and the community? And what does that mean for the child? Um, you know, same with Froebel. So, so to me, what's happened is that not just a, a teacher, but also a whole, early childhood centre has to develop a philosophy statement, which means they engage in quite particular ways with philosophers of education, searching through them for something that they can then write down on paper to say, this is our, our philosophy, rather than we do philosophical work. So if they don't like or can't make sense of Rousseau, which is quite possible, or Foucault, or um, you know, and I'm using a, a narrow range of, uh, you know, there's a narrow demographic in what I'm talking about here as well. I recognize that. So, uh, you know, so, so the, those, those traditional philosophers that are produced in, in the curriculum, um, you know, they don't necessarily speak to the people who are writing their philosophy statements on one level, but also the fact that they're even being asked to write philosophy statements is, a, is something of a of a performance that maybe undermines the potential, although I don't like the word potential, um, of philosophy of education for, for teaching, for teacher education. Um, you know, the other thing I was thinking in relation to that, oh, and by the way, I, you know, if, if you could imagine like, Every time you read an, a school or a centre philosophy statement, Whitney Houston, you know, singing "I believe the children are our future," it makes me well up with tears. But it also makes me realise how cliched some of these philosophy statements are. And and so yeah, so the other thing is to, to realise that there's a colonising process going on in the relation to the philosophy of education that you know is, is hugely I ironic. Uh, when it when we turn now to post structuralism and post humanism and um, and like 
new materialist methodologies because, for instance, for Māori in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, it, it's like being told, okay, well, after 150 odd years or so, you know, after this amount of colonization, uh, the, the academy is now realizing the error of its ways, but, uh, you know, and turning to ways of thinking about the world that, that were actually suppressed, you know, very viciously, you know, by the British as they arrived. Uh, you know, and this is in a, in a week of, of, of the nation being invited to, we, we're having a day off in a couple of, in a couple of weeks to, to remember the Queen. Um, so, you know, now's a good moment to realize that when the, when the, when, when a colonial ships arrived, they are, they arrived with an idea about philosophy and about science that is being, um, you know, that is being replaced slowly, chip by chip, but in ways that don't recognize the knowledge that was already here. Um, so yeah, I would, I would love to be, I mean, Rose Petty, for instance, uh, her, her, her works, um, and, you know, her work around different models of understanding life and the child and, her, and, and the cosmos. Um, should be quite familiar to someone who's trying to make sense of new material ways of, of thinking. Um, yeah, I don't know quite what my point is there other than to perhaps recognize the, you know, the terrible and tragic irony of where we're at in relation to philosophy of education and, and, and our colonial past. Well, present, what am I talking about? Our colonial now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, speaking of, well, with that, it kind of, um, you brought up technology and how also not only a philosophy of education can be, it, it still has a very, a colonizing tendency um, and it al almost fixing, like it's making things rigid where we're like, where's the playfulness and thinking through ideas and, you know, productive playfulness where it's doing something um, not for the sake of getting to the end point, but rather for the sake of doing. Um, mm -hmm. And when, when well, I, I know I'll speak for someone, I'm reading your work, especially with using science fiction, it almost starts inviting in that, that speculative thinking of how can we think differently through thinking philosophically rather than, oh, here's my position, I'm doing philosophy. Um, and I wanted to bring up your book, which has one of the best titles, and I'm very jealous of it, but uh, The Matrix Ate My Baby. I Every time I read that title, I think it's I, it's just 100% great. Um, but you also, you do think about the question of technology, thinking philosophically, the child, um, and through, say, science fiction as a frame. Um, can you discuss what um, science fiction offers for thinking about childhood and child education that maybe you know taking those philosophical positions may not i can um or why do you like to use science fiction also it would be the two yeah ones. yeah i'm thinking about okay so i mean obviously as i said before science fiction was was a a way for me to recognize a discontent with my high schooling um, and so so I found a voice in relation to things that had been concerning me um, and I was successful at high school I was you know I was, I was like um, I was being managed and produced by the high school not to be an early childhood teacher that's for sure like <laughs> um, I don't think that would have been their vision for me um, and they would have had one. And yeah, so I remember talking to my dean at the time, at, like after, you know, hey, <laughs> I remember talking to my dean at the time, like when I realized that school wasn't for me and suggesting I might leave school and the dean saying, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think you should go. Um, so yeah so the first thing is that science fiction got me out of education and into a, a education in an institutional space and into an idea of uh t 
teaching and learning, you know, through organic connections around um, interests and passions. So that, you know, that was a, that, that was the first step. Um, movies like Blade Runner just compelled me to watch them again and again and again. Um, and, you know, and, and then read to Android Stream of Electric Sheep again and again and again and get different things out of them and get angry with them and realize that you've missed things in them. Like, especially with Do Android Stream, there's some things that each time I read it, I go, how did I not notice this the first time? Um, and, and then to understand, like, the questions that are key for those writers, uh, well, that writer, Philip Hay Dick, but also that then transfer into, you know, a film that's, that's just an awesome film for for asking and inviting questions. Um, I mean, when when Blade Runner came out, it did not get a good reception, but it's become, you know, obviously quite a quite a different thing. Um, but I, I'll watch any any piece of science fiction and get something out of it. Like, I mean, I don't I don't really call. Cool although maybe it's not my position to call anything science fiction or not. I don't really um, call Star Wars science fiction. You know, it's, it's kind of fantasy. It's, um, you know, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't on the surface represent strong science fiction questions and narratives, but R2-D2 and C-3PO, right, uh, to me, like engaging carefully an analysis of their conversations in movies that are otherwise are, are healthily disrespected um, like you know the first three you know which are obviously you know everyone finds it difficult to deal with Anakin's growth and um, you know and find you know some of the characters problematic but when R2-D2 and C-3PO are talking about um, what it means to be human and what it means to be machine, like they, because they're so subtle, um, you know, you go back to them again and again and go, you know, why why are they having this conversation about, um, and you know, and very contradictory statements that C3PO makes to R2D2 about decision making and humanity and and artificial intelligence. Um, so I'm just. Yeah, I'm always looking for that. So I'll go prospecting for that gold in any rubbish that I can find. Um, well, that I, you know, I find it's a terrible movie. Like I'm not really enjoying it, but I'll watch it again and again just just to see things. Um, and then if I think about specifically early childhood science fiction, like when I was writing my PhD. I started to realize that one way in which I'm going to have to engage with children in their digital worlds is to look at the production of those digital worlds through new media, um, through television in particular, and through film. So I was quite lucky at the time that Digimon was being released. Um, so I got to watch a lot of Digimon. And, and the good thing about Digimon is it did really put to children questions concerning um, the real and the artificial and the relationship that children have, you know, in ways that would suggest that whoever the writers were, they had an understanding of Sherry Turkle's work, Sherry Turkle's work, for instance, from MIT, like just in terms of care for the artificial world, care for material and care for machines. Um, and the, and, you know, the, the changing nature of humanity and, and the more than human in relation, you know, that's really super in Digimon. And then, then you get the benefit of also seeing that they Digimon steps out of itself and says, okay, here's, here's a child that plays the game, you know, plays the card game and then creates their own card and then ends up in the storyline, which really kind of plays on, um, you know, blurring those boundaries. So I've, Digimon was great. I, I was also at the same time watching Dragon Ball Z, which is not about the digital world, but I particularly also enjoyed because of its capacity to slow time down, like to, to watch one fight, one fight scene that would take seven episodes and be just like, you know, powering up, uh, you know, anyway, people did question whether or not I was spending my 
doctoral research productively by watching these shows and that comes back to that question the or that observation you had Amy about being productively playful in your work um like I you know I can't I can't undermine observations or concerns around like um like the privilege of playfulness um so you know when people are like you know, questioning how it is that you can, you know, have fun what when you do things when when what we do is serious. Um, but also, you know, for me, it, it's it's vital to do that, and it's vital to 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 share and encourage that, and to suggest that, you know, we can look. You know, we, we, you know, there's no formula for being fun and playful in your philosophical work. Um, but and and there shouldn't be a burden to do that either. Otherwise, it then becomes just another criterion to tick off in in a peer review. Did I have fun reading this article, or did, did they engage with fun correctly uh, in order to get published? And that's not what I want. But but certainly, like I think we need to allow for the possibility that there's that humour and playfulness and fun have have an important role to play. Um, and you also, I mean, you draw on science fiction. Mm -hmm you know, analytically, and maybe you could talk a, a little bit more about that. So you have, there, we have a, we have one question here, which is what is Franken education? Um, oh, yeah. And how has science run amok? I mean, this is, this is a case of you, you know, taking up science fiction and, and literature and, and, you know, using it as an analytical, you know, philosophical, yeah. not analytical philosophy, but a, a philosoph an, a analytical philosophical tool. And maybe you could talk Talk a little bit about those themes and 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 the importance of those themes and, and what you do. So the concern within science fiction for the role of science is, is one that uh, motivates me in terms of analysis of the sciences of education or how, you know, like behavioral sciences in particular, um, how they contribute to an, an attempt to um, to create a particular kind of child subject and how they might, you know, if we think of, if we think of the teacher or the school leader or the center, the center head teacher or, or the policymaker is always potentially going to end up in some kind of Victor Frankenstein role where they want to produce this, um, this perfection they want they want to show they can create something that's that's a beautiful human and what's going to and what's likely to happen as a result um so, so i've 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 been mainly concerned with using science fiction to tell a story about an, our anxieties in education to produce a particular kind of subject or to resolve a particular kind of problem and that's become increasingly uh, also influenced by a reading on, you know, I guess like control and predictability. So David Kupferman is is really keen to continue writing about control societies um, as as the ongoing projects, and we haven't had time to do it up up till this stage. But you know, everywhere it's popping up. So like dur during three weeks of recovery from COVID, I've, I I. I decided like I was going to try my hardest not to work and found myself working through reading Dan Simmons's Hyperion and, and Endymion series. And in that, um, it, it engages really thoroughly with the problem of, of, an, of a society that's determined to create the a predictability godhead, um, you know, that nothing is ever going to be left to chance. And I think you know, one way to get to that through a more traditional philosophy of education approach would be to read, for instance, Hurt Beaster's The Beautiful Risk of Education and 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 is writing all about the problems of measurement societies. Um, so, you know, so for me, I've been engaged in, you know, what goes wrong when you attempt to perfect things um, and, you, and you believe that you can possibly predict and then control all potential educational outcomes. So that that's one way. I mean, there's two ways I use it. So firstly, science fiction that engages with um, the Promethean problem. Um, and then science fiction that engages with the algorithmic problem. Um, 
yeah it's it's everywhere around us and then it brings us back to heidegger as well and like he he writes beautifully i can't remember sorry in which text about you know the curious excess of frantic measurement um and and you know for me at the moment in aotearoa new zealand there's a real um you know there's a real swell of that and anxiety and excess and it's led to you know investing in international programs for behavior management of children that you know that you know that try and detect and then eradicate behaviors that are considered to be like um well conduct disorder so there was an attempt a few years back by the ministry of education to have a national screening of four-year-olds for conduct disorder i mean you know, there's the material where science fiction is is going to offer us some kind of like play with what where that's going to go. Um, but it also helps. Science fiction also helps to reveal what's under those kinds of anxieties. Um, you know, fortunately, we resisted the national screening, but it's come it's come up in new ways. Now we have um, social competence progress tools like seeping in so you know so so every three-year-old and four-year-old is going to have to be observed and treated with social competence progress tools well it's it's a, there's an interesting tension between the fact that uh all colleges of education have to do that performative um statement of values and their philosophy of education mm -hmm. statements um but yet the um the administrative logics that prevail in many of these, um, you know, policies that are rolled out and then implemented and adopted are so instrumental, so guided by uh, logics like the, the Frankenstein logic of, um, you know, uh, the fantasy of uh, being able to master uh, nature and, and control it, predict it, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, that 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 seems to me is somewhat of an interesting tension that that can that 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 can be um easily um sort of legitimated narrated justified in, in highly sort of progressive or humanistic language but yet at its basis it's uh instrumental and um uh yeah um yeah so i find i find that some, somewhat interesting I mean, there's such a dislike of science fiction um that it's actually quite a challenging approach um you know when i when i bring up science fiction in the class um it's not normally particularly pretty effective so i have to find ways of using science fiction but not advocating for science fiction um you know in a, in a lecture theater of you know of a couple of hundred there might be four or five students who are who are already keen on science fiction so they see this as an invitation and a release and you can see them kind of light up and go oh i can i can do that but the rest of the class you know at least based on just you know visual <laughs> visuals is like what why are we doing this um you know, so, you know some of the ways that i experiment with this and and i'm you know i've been talking with my great colleague Amy about this is, is developing things like empathy tests as playful experiments around how to how to engage student teachers not in science fiction but in the sorts of questions that science fiction invites us to ask about for instance what is empathy and how does a teacher show empathy and you know should we be can, you know, should we take an instrumental approach to empathy so that we know that every teacher walks in with a, a with a definable and observable and measurable and accessible and develop developmentable or whatever the word is um, approach to their empathy. Um, and so you, often the, the, the way I do that is is by asking them how they feel about the possibility that an, an algorithm is going to eventually replace them as a teacher and what, what they think that they bring that's not programmable that's not codable and so that gets the conversation going much better than if i talk to them about blade runner or um there's a one of philip k dick's novels um, martian time slip there's a the, the father of a child on mars is reflecting on the benefits and costs of 
of robot teachers. Um, you know, he's not, he's sitting on the fence in some ways, but also there's a melancholia for, for a past where you're, the teacher was human. Um, my question to the student teachers is what's actually human about you in relation to your study? If your study is very technical and instrumental in terms of your center or classroom practice. I mean, and I think that's really interesting too when you bring up the empathy. I, I think about what if you did that test, but where do you see too with science fiction as being possibly, um, I don't want to say like a tool, but maybe a way in to complicate or maybe make known how already the way that education policy and how you're saying in Aotearoa in New Zealand how there are these behavior modifications where it's almost like what's the empathy rubric you know yeah. how are you going to teach that to a child but then presenting a counterpoint well what if we think about empathy through a science fiction lens to kind of i guess maybe unsettle with the um, student teachers in early childhood education i wonder how you see that working that, that's the challenge i guess for for my work is to you know to share the benefit i mean because if the neither the philosophy of education and in, in terms of um dewey or rousseau or or foucault or barad in, in terms of you know recent um developments and particularly in early childhood education you know if if that's something that at, at this stage seems inaccessible in some way or if or if science fiction seems inaccessible in some way then my role or my motivation is is the um is the challenge to address the apparent inaccessibility and and that's that, so that's my ongoing um you know daily nightly wake up in the middle of the night go oh i know i'll try this kind of challenge like how about showing that piece of work or how about asking these kinds of questions um you know but my task isn't to advocate for science fiction i guess it's to advocate for engagement with something that uh, that nourishes your your questions and your openness to your practice as a teacher or your commitment to your community or um or whatever i guess um and doing it in a way that recognizes people's stories their narratives their um you know the the things that both make possible and impossible engagements with particular kinds of of genres or particular kinds of um media what um so andrew what is an impossible philosophy of education and how does this idea of an impossible philosophy of education, uh, how does it, um, what, what does it help us understand about our current sort of catastrophic condition that we, that we find ourselves in today? So, so that's, that's quite a, a new, I mean, a, a good and new question for me. Um, I am working with a group of colleagues on impossible. So what's almost impossible or barely imaginable um, but you have imagined it, so therefore, you know, how could you then take up that that seemingly impossible something and use it to to question and to challenge and to reveal um, our predicament or or our predicament, maybe not ours. I mean, and that's where I, I guess uh, you know I love the work of Ursula Le Guin for 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 taking something that at the moment might be regarded as, well, that's not gonna happen, but, but weaving it into the now. You were talking about Ursula Le Guin and an impossible philosophy of education and trying to think that concept in relation to our catastrophic condition, climate, you know, I mean, by, by which we mean climate change, threats of nuclear war, financial meltdown, all the other stuff that's we're sort of uh, authoritarianism, all the other stuff that we're sort of dealing with today. Yeah, so the, the work around impossible that 
that or, and the seemingly impossible or the the unimaginable is um sorry i'm getting, i'm nervous that i'm going to lose you <laughs> um okay. whatever i say um if, if it shuts us down again it's because of what i say so let's, <laughs> let's just imagine let's just imagine the um, the apparent impossibility of life without the internet um or the you know or the apparent impossibility of immortality which obviously science fiction is playing with all the time um and good science fiction plays with with it in a quite different way to to uh, or at least science fiction that motivates me sorry not good but I, i'm motivated by science fiction which wakes wakes me up in relation to um you know what the what the apparent impossibility might mean for for now for now and today and so i remember being at a at a philosophy of education conference where someone had shouted out from the audience about how we all desire to live forever and wondering about how that that desire engaged with its apparent impossibility drives um drives education systems and you know if anyone's really ever thought about the implications for education of immortality like um so so I started working with Marta Cabral on on an encyclopedia of intergalactic pedagogy based on this idea of well you know what what happens for education systems um and what's possible for education systems when presented with at least for for most people the impossibility of first contact um you know for other people it's not an impossibility and it's already been and gone um so so there are awesome questions for education to ask when confronted by this idea of like how does our curriculum change when we're faced with um, a very different understanding of of the galaxy of the universe of the cosmos of of travel um of of biology you know what are the what are the things that we just absolutely have no idea about that first contact is then going to introduce and then require us to rethink in terms of education um you know definitely uh, various writers have thought about all kinds of devices for undermining how we think about education right now for instance you know even with even within the matrix you know the idea of just like plugging in coding in oh, i know how to fly a helicopter kind of or i know kung fu um or you know or there's a pill that you take and suddenly you know what you need to know or you behave in the way you want to behave um but the other i guess the other thing that excites me about the impossibility is just the challenge to question some things you know so when i'm when i'm working to give a really practical example i work with student teachers in the early childhood space who who take this notion of of possibility and impossibility and apply it without without necessarily thinking and in relation to mm -hmm. development um you know so so i can use the device to to invite them to reveal the limits that they have developed without thinking in relation to child development you know what what a, what a two-year-old or three-year-old or a 11 year old or an eight-year-old are, are, are what's possible for them and what's impossible for them so so there's some awesome pedagogical work to do there um yeah it, it's it's good experimental work and it also helps reveal some of those elements of our values and beliefs that don't end up in those position statements and don't end up on those profiles for the schools or the center um ursula Le Guin's great for it also because of you know the, the way in which she invites science fiction to be understood as as a critique of the already present so that possible impossible connection becomes you know an exciting um both you know a, a thoughtful and practical experiment um so andrew i think that that's a a good note to um wrap things up with today i want to thank you um my daughter is here and she needs to go to uh, martial arts so <laughs> So I have to get her off to that, but it's been it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and learn more about about your work. Um, I'm looking forward to 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 seeing more of it. You, there's a there's a good connection to I know Kung Fu there. Yeah. Um, 
have you ever seen the king of kong i mean there's an awesome documentary that's a for... great that's a great that's a great film i love that yeah. film. <laughs> there's there's that moment where like someone who is expert in their field of playing arcade games is interrupted by fatherhood and and i need to go party it's just like <laughs> probably one of the best pieces of documentary film i've ever seen yeah that was really fun um yeah. I've never seen a crowd of moviegoers and stitches for an entire film just like quite like I was. But anyway, uh, okay. Thank thank you two for for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a pleasure. Thank you.